we are talking about the pauses. All the pauses that us gals go through. The peri, the post, the minute. Y'all know all the stuff. Welcome to the Girls Talk Healthy Aging Podcast, where we dive deep into pressing health and fitness issues facing aging women. I'm Allie Kerr. And I'm Shauna Kaminsky. And together we'll bring candid conversations, expert advice, and personal stories that will inspire and empower you on your own wellness journey. Shauna, tell us, I am dying to know how you got so interested in diving so deep and really becoming the expert on the pauses. It's kind of one of those things that I fell into from um, not interest as much as need. And it all started with my mom's passing about 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, there wasn't the focus on menopause that you see now in social media in you know, it's becoming just more widely accepted, more information is available about it back then. You know, it was kind of the dirty M word that nobody really wanted to talk about. Yeah. And um, in unraveling or dealing with the passing of my mom, mm-hmm. I came to realize that a lot of her health issues stemmed from her being thrown into early menopause with a radical hysterectomy in her 30s. And, you know, I didn't I, I didn't realize all the things that she was going through. And, you know, so that was even before then. So there was no internet at that time. There were just, there was no resources for her. So it, it really kind of came from, um, from that. And of course, my age, because I was 50 and probably, you know, dealing with some of the, the, the things as well. So from a personal standpoint, um, I had to do some investigating. So it, that, that's kind of how I became interested or decided that this is something I need to kind of dig deep in, into. Yeah. And both of us work with ladies of all different ages. So this is something that I know we both run into with clients and it's, this just the different things that they're going through. And for you, with your own experience, when did you recognize that things were changing for you? When, when like, what is something you remember that really stands out where you were like, ah, maybe I'm dealing with some Paul's going on here? Yeah. And, you know, probably similar to my mom, I ended up, and this is TMI, but, you know, we're, right. <laughs> we're girls talking, is <laughs> I had a, a hysterectomy in my, I think I was 41 at the time. Wow. And, um, you know, I was left with my ovaries, but, um, and it's because I had um, endometriosis which my mom probably had. Um, and, uh, but at that time, my mom had like everything taken her, her ovaries and everything taken. Um, and so I was left with no period, which was fantastic. Um, you know, no endometriosis, um, you know, symptoms or anything. And, uh, So that happened to me in my early 40s. And it just never dawned on me that, hey, I well, I guess it did dawn on me, but it's like, okay, well, what am I going to do about it? Is that I wouldn't really notice when my period stopped. And so I think I was probably around 48, 49, maybe when I started to feel a little hot. So I, I, and honestly, I think that was one of the only symptoms that I experienced. Mm -hmm. And um, I know my mom was plunged into immediate depression. And I don't know about the hot flashes because I, I just was unaware at that age. Yeah, Um, people didn't talk about it as, like you said, women didn't talk about these things as much. Yeah. 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 And I know my sister, um, you know, had more symptoms than me, but uh, also, so I feel like from a hereditary standpoint, I could be set up for, uh, you know, some nasty symptoms, but I am a big advocate for a healthy lifestyle and how healthy lifestyle can really um, offset a lot of the symptoms of menopause. Um, and so addressing those, I think, is the number one kind of defense against menopause. 
And and let's talk about some of those. What are some things that women can do that we have the power because there's things that are out of our control, but yeah, one or two things that we can do that can help us through this crazy time. Well, you know, I call myself a menopause expert in air quotes, but I, I want to, to qualify that I am an expert on health, nutrition, fitness. I am not a medical doctor. And so it's really important that I stay in my lane. But having said that, one of the first lines of defense would be to talk to your doctor. And I think that's really important because a lot of things can be dressed up or just, you know, oh, must just be menopause when it could actually be like hypothyroidism or like there could be other issues going on. So it's really Mm -hmm. important that you're checking in with your practitioner to see, hey, what's going on? Um, And the other thing is that you... um, menopause hormone replacement or, you know, hormone replacement therapy or whatever you're going to call Sometimes it's called menopause hormone um, therapy, whatever. Getting hormones is an an option for some, but not a panacea. It's not the be all end all for everybody, but it's something definitely that you should be talking to your doctor about. Mm. And Unfortunately, um, not every doctor is willing to have that conversation. Yeah, I was just going to say, just with my ladies, I'm I'm fortunate that because I work with clients in, in a training setting, I get to see women going that are in that stage. And I also get to see the ones that are doing well. And I get to see who they go to, what doctors they go to. And so that has been super helpful because um, there is a difference because, I mean, you know, you, you want to just find the right fit with a doctor, I would think. I would yeah. think that would be a thing yeah. because that's one thing I see is when, the, you know, really having the right doctor that really understands hormones in women and what's going on there can make a huge difference into the result those ladies are getting from the help and the resources. And there are so, like, I'm so glad that I'm alive now versus, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, because I just cannot. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is, is a lot of doctors, um, number one, some of them aren't really well versed in it. They are versed in other things and there's 34 plus symptoms. And as a, as a woman that hasn't, you know, just like what the heck is going on with me? You don't even know that some of the symptoms are actually symptoms of menopause. You just know that you're not well. And so um, lots of times doctor's visits are, are, you know, short in nature and they don't have the time to go through everything with you. Mm -hmm. So if your doctor is not entertaining, you know, that talk, then maybe it's, time to consider another doctor and I think I think we're getting better Um, the medical um, you know uh, community is getting better about providing Mm -hmm. uh, care it there's a long way to go on that Mm -hmm. one thing I do want to caution against it and I understand um, you know where it comes from it's from the basic frustration of women that go to their doctor that seems to have been trusted for years that just has no ears for their condition it's not really a condition but you know it's just a passage of life like puberty is but if they have no no they're not going to listen to them um then oftentimes they will turn to alternative medicine and i i'm not trashing um alternative medicine but i am saying that sometimes um you know bioidentical or compounded hormones will be presented and that may not be the the best solution just because those they are not um, FDA approved they are um, you know they they can be effective but they are um, you know they don't have the same testing and it's important for women to be asking their their practitioner whoever is um, us prescribing the compounds is uh, who's actually profiting. So if the person prescribing the medicine is actually profiting from the compounding of that medicine, Mm -hmm. it is just time to ask more questions and maybe get a second opinion on that. Because you could probably get pharmaceutical grade 
um, hormones, which are basically the same thing for a, a fraction of the cost. So it's really important to dig deep on this. And the reason why I bring this up is because one of my current clients is really struggling to be paying for her bio, bioidentical hormones. But then upon further research, um, you know, those hormones, like they, they kind of get health washed because you think, oh, bioidentical, that sounds great. They are natural. Well, they're, they're made out of the same things that the synthetic ones are made out of. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of marketing involved with, with menopause, which is really annoying to a certain degree because women aren't getting the care they need. Yeah. And just finding that match, what fits you best, you know, um, I have clients that do really well with, you know, like pellets and, you know, some of those top things. Um, it's, but it's, I think it is just finding what suits you best by, as far as your pocketbook and as far as your, you know, your body, of course, your body is the main thing and finding that position that understands hormones and is going to be able to give you different options and help you find the best option for you. Um, I think to be honest, Ellie, the best, the best option is the one that has the widest safety margins mm -hmm. based on scientific studies. Yeah. And things like pellets and compounded hormones don't have the studies behind them. They are a multi-million dollar business. Sure. That none of that, none of the, the profits are going to studies. So if I were a woman looking out for, you know, some kind of medical um, intervention, I would be wanting to get the intervention that has the most um, proof that, you know, it's, it's not going to cause problems later down the road. And I do want to um, dispel the myth of breast cancer and hormone replacement therapy. That was from a 1990 study the, by the WHI, Women's Health Initiative, that was, um, has since been kind of debunked. And um, that's been said to be one of the biggest, um, what's the word I want to say, um, miss, what's the... <laughs> misuse of of you know science science that so many women um suffered because women just all of a sudden stopped doing hormone replacement doctors wouldn't um prescribe and then it took many years to kind of turn that ship around and yeah. and i kind of missed out on that like yeah. i never do yeah. hormone replacement and that's one of the challenges i mean even with science i mean science we're always learning you know like like we said things are so much different now than they were for our mothers and our grandmothers and they're going to be so much better and different for the further next generation and the next generation so we we have to go with the information the best information that we have and the best resources that we have at this at this moment and things do change as we get new information you know we we learn like ah oh, like with the the studies you're talking about so so tell us with your kind of things that you remember as far as watching your mom or, you know, just more about how that impacted your journey going through this and, and with the women that you, um, that you now work with. Well, you know, like I said, I, at the time, um, you know, witnessing my mom and her transition. And I didn't even understand that it was like a radical transition, but you know, my mom, my mom really, really struggled. And then that translated into, you know, depression and maybe some mental illness related to depression and then substance abuse related to that. And then health issues related to that. So it was really like a domino effect sure. that, that could have been, um, you know, offset with a little knowledge. And so that's why I, I, I come from an educational background. I was a teacher for 20 years. So teaching is what I do. I just have a different audience now. And so I just think it's imperative to arm yourself with as much knowledge as possible. You know, some people know more about their car than they know about their, their own body in a lot of ways. So learning, so I, you know, I first addressed, you know, kind of the medical, mm -hmm. um, you know, avenue to 
look at how to deal with menopausal symptoms. And that that's the area that is, you know, some something that I say, hey, that's not in my lane. You need to talk to your medical practitioner about that. Uh, but there's so many lifestyle things, as you know, Allie, um, in terms of nutrition, sleep, stress, exercise, all the all these things that uh, if you're, you know, if you take care of those, some of the other symptoms will will take care of themselves because menopause is not a disease. Menopause is just a it's a natural trans transition. Mm. You know, we're not going to call our teenagers diseased because they're going through puberty. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good point. You know, and and when you consider that a woman's life, half of her life is going to be dealing with menopause related issues if they because they can start as early as the early 40s. You know, the average age of of like full menopause is about 51. And so, if you know, the average age of um, mortality is 83 point nine or something like that let's say 84 so honestly for over 40 years a lot of us are going to be dealing with menopause and a lot of people don't even realize that in their early 40s you know oh they might feel more joint pain or less ability to recover from workouts or their sleep gets disrupted or their brain gets a little muddled up sometimes and Mm -hmm. you know because this is all um, happening at the same time as kids are getting older, parents, like our parents are getting older and we're in the sandwich generation now, like taking care of little ones, taking care of elders. We just, we're just caught in the middle and we just think, oh, it's just us. It's like, okay, there's all this situational stuff going on as well Mm -hmm. as, you know, physiological things going on. So women really, you know, it's a really, time. I think a lot of women don't realize and we don't equate it to that. And some of that as as this becomes something that is more talked about and people become more aware of the different symptoms that may change. But I definitely see this with clients that I have that are struggling and they're at a certain age. One of the things that I want them to do is get their hormones checked out and just see where they are. If they're, you know, if they're noticing changes and a lot of times they attribute it to stress or, you know, and you, and you just kind of, I know that I do this with people. I just ask questions of, okay, when did this start? And, you know, if you started gaining weight, were you gaining this weight, you know, three years ago, what, what's changed? Why did this start happening now? What has changed in your life? And so you start looking at those things and sometimes it can be situational And then sometimes you're like, there's got to be something going on maybe with the hormones. Maybe that's something we should at least look at because you're, these things were not happening and now they are. And and these things were, you know, you're, something's different here. Something is different here. There's change going on. Absolutely. And, you know, it sounds so clean and clear to say, let's just get our hormones checked. But it doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your hormones fluctuate, fluctuate. through the yeah. even through the day. So, so all all hormone replacement um, is is done through symptomology. So, right. you know, if, you're, if you go to your doctor and you talk about all the things Absolutely. like low feeling, low libido, you know, mm-hmm. um, depression, weight gain, like all, you know night sweats, hot flashes, like, you know, there's like six or seven, but then there's like 34, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, your doctor will probably assess that and look at your age and other, um, other factors. But, you know, I don't want women to get the false sense of security that they can go to someone and get a saliva test or a blood test, or a Mm -hmm. Dutch test, and be told, oh, yes, you are in menopause, or you are in early menopause, or you're in your, it doesn't work that way. But it, it is a conversation with um, a medical doctor that is required. Yeah. And yeah, and then, and then also giving ourselves grace for the time of life that we're in. And, um, you know, taking that into account like a lot of times it's not going to change. You still have teenagers, you still have aging parents, but then just knowing that, okay, I'm actually not going crazy. I'm just dealing the best I can. 
And maybe, you know, something hormonally might be going on with me. So maybe I could give myself the benefit of the doubt by, you know, um, allowing, even just having a doctor's talk, Mm -hmm. just knowing you're not, and knowing you're not alone or not crazy makes a big difference. That is, that is a big one, because I do think people feel, especially when you start having those symptoms and they just, they're new to you, you really probably do. I think a lot of people do feel alone or they just feel like, what is wrong with me? You know, what, what is wrong with me? Why am I, why am I feeling this way? Am I losing my mind? Am I going crazy? I actually through, and we'll, I know we'll talk about this in another episode, but through my Crohn's journey, I've actually had my hormones get out of whack due to medication and and, you know, we did have to do some testing to figure out because, you know, I'm not at the, in the pauses uh, late or in that that stage yet. And especially when I had this issue, I was in my late 20s, um, you know, early 30s. So it was a, just a different scenario. But I, I but I do know that I felt like I was losing my mind and I was crazy and that like what is wrong with me and um, yeah. hormones affect so many things. So I do think it's um, really awesome that you know that I know that that just the support that you give to people and just you know helping them understand like we're not alone gals we're not alone and we're not crazy and we're not losing our minds and um you know just just and this and the support of the things that we can control through our nutrition through our somewhat through our sleep through our fitness and our activity and so what um in particular, do you have any, as far as exercise, I know that, you know, me and you are both from that exercise realm. What, what do you find that people are maybe getting wrong as far as exercise as they're aging that maybe they could tweak that might get them better results? Well, it's two ends of the spectrum. So Mm. first of all, one of the number one complaints is weight gain and especially weight gain around the midsection. And so there was a Ponzer study that came out that said, hey, hey, <clears throat> sorry, metabolism doesn't change, um, you know, from zero to 60. We can't really blame um, specific metabolic changes on menopause. Uh, however, you know, there are some changes related to menopause, but it's mo- but it, it's mostly um, based on habits. And there's a trickle down from that I can talk about. But so given that the number one, um, oh, and we tend to deposit fat more readily around the abdomen area. And so we're really noticing it around the belly, whereas before we might notice it more in the breast, the hips, the bum, the legs, the arms, but now it really gets concentrated on your belly. So, you know, people really, women notice, hey, I've got a menopause belly now. So given that that's the number one complaint, um, and as far as exercise goes, there's two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is I am just going to run this belly off. <clears throat> Sorry, drink a water. No, you're good. I mean, I, I'm just going to exercise and exercise and exercise. And a lot of women just go the cardio route and it's just like harder, longer, more, more, more. And that doesn't work. They soon find out. And so um, the other end of the spectrum is, you know, not enough activity uh, and they don't really notice how sedentary they are. And so, um, so what we really have to find is something happy, you know, right in the middle, which Mm -hmm. is going to include some zone two cardio, which is the kind of cardio that gets you out of breath, but you can still uh, hold a conversation with some effort and strength training. And, and you and I both know, Allie, that strength training is so important as we age, because not only with, um, so we need that zone to cardio to help with cardiovascular health. So zone two cardio, you got to get your heart pumping, ladies. You got to get a little breath going, like, you know, feeling it like you're working, like you're doing something. And yeah, and because cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women. So yes, yes. addressing that. But then also osteoporosis is, you yes. know, we're at risk for that, especially as menopause comes on because we're, we lose bone density. And we're also simultaneously losing muscle if we're not doing anything to offset that. Oh, yeah. Strength training uh, helps with both um, improving bone density and helping with 
um, you know, muscle maintenance and even building muscle. And muscle is the metabolic fuel that keeps, you know, keeps you going so that you have energy, so you have shape, so you have function. And the older I get, the more I want, you know, I am as vain as they come. I want to look good in the mirror, but I also want to be functional. And the more, the older I get, the more I'm training for function. Yes, yes, I definitely see that chan- that transition as just working with ladies of different ages is the function thing becomes more important, especially when people start having grandkids and they're wanting to get on the floor and do all the things and go enjoy all the things. And uh, I, I so hope that that's a message that I know that you've spent your life's work tra- getting women to understand and I, myself as well is the strength training piece and how crucial that is for us gals to like you said, it gives us shape. And so one of the big complaints that women have is that they're losing their shape or they yeah. don't like the shape and strength training, weight training, lifting something that has weight to it that's challenging. Yes. Yeah. So crucial for us to keep any kind of shape to our body that the good shape, keeping our bones strong, keeping our ligaments, our tendons, keeping all the good tissue in our bodies that we want to have to make that keep that keep us younger, longer, and functional, like you said. Yeah. So yes, that's that's um a big takeaway. Um, the strength training and then the cardio. You're, you're, uh, I love that you point out that that is such a big thing for us gals. Is, is the cardiovascular disease is a big killer. It takes us out, and we were, you know, one of the things we spend time talking about is running out of time, and that we want to have as much time to do all the things with all the people that we want to in this life. And can I just mention that, you know, when when I said that, um, you know, two ends of the spectrum in terms of some women are just doing so much cardio, you do get to a point of diminishing returns with the cardio because those women are doing the cardio for weight loss. And the yeah. weight loss might be achieved through bone density loss and muscle loss. Absolutely. What kind of tissue are you losing when you're losing weight? Yeah. And so yes. while, not all the same. <laughs> yeah. So while they they may be getting benefit from, you know, the cardiovascular aspect of their fitness, which is important, it it we can't have that at the cost of losing bone density and muscle. So there has to be the balance. Yeah, so I'm so glad you pointed that out because that is definitely a challenge that I know that it is really hard to get women not to focus 100% everything on the number on the scale and yeah. understanding what that number means and then what it doesn't mean. Just because that number goes up or down does not mean good or bad. You know, that is, it's not bad, good because I can, like when dealing with Crohn's, I can lose weight and that's very bad. It's, it's, I'm losing very good tissue and good good weight when that happens and that's not a good thing and so yeah so yeah taking the number off the the number on the scale and understanding that a higher number is not necessarily a bad number so looking more the age Mm -hmm. composition yeah than, than the number absolutely yeah yeah. Yeah. Well, I say we just will wrap up here and just encouraging, you know, my wish for, for you all is that you do some strength training and lift something heavy to keep that good tissue and that you work that ticker, work your heart so that you keep it strong and do some cardiovascular. It doesn't have to be so long, but do get something that gets your heart rate up. And Shauna, do you have anything, any wishes that you want to add to that? Uh, my wish for women is to give themselves time and grace uh, in this busy time of life when you're dealing with so many other people is Mm -hmm. to focus a little bit on yourself and check in with yourself, check in with your doctor, check in with your, your friends. um, And don't, you know, don't go it alone. Don't just think, Hey, it's just me. I'm just going to white knuckle myself through because you've got probably 40 plus years of white knuckling and your quality of life can be much higher if you uh, get educated on uh, healthy ways to deal with some of the potential health uh, issues that might be coming up for you at this time. So I think we're out of time. <laughs> yes, but I do want to remind people too, if you are, if any of this is resonating with you, then please uh, follow us, uh, like us, review us on Apple and Spotify. Thank y'all so much for listening. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And until next time, bye.
Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. You'll find me, Allie, on Instagram at Allie Kerr Fitness. And you'll find me, Shauna, on Instagram at Shauna Kaminsky. Feel free to pop us a DM with questions and or feedback. Until next time, be healthy and be happy.